It's good to see each of you out at the Lord's house. Glad you made the decision to be here. Glad we have the ability to be here. And I hope you've come willing and ready to worship the Lord. He's worthy of our worship. Amen. That's kind of weak. He's worthy of our worship. Amen. He, he is. So I hope you came with that mindset, that attitude today. If you're able, if you would, rise to your feet. We're going to begin by going to the Lord in prayer. And then after that, Brother Matt's going to come and lead us in a congregational song together. Let's pray. Lord and Heavenly Father, as we come to you today, we just thank you, O oh God, for this day. Thank you for your just the blessings of life that you've bestowed upon us for the health and the strength we have, for the freedom that we have that we remember on this weekend, Lord. We thank you even more so for the spiritual freedom that we have through your Son, Jesus Christ. Lord, as we gather here, let us honor you. Let us lift you up in all that we do. We pray this in Christ's name. Amen. Amen. Let's just say this morning, God is good. Amen. 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 God is good. 553. 553 in your brown hymnal. We'll do the first and last stanza. We've got a couple of patriotic hymns to sing this morning. As you're turning, turn around there and wave at somebody, tell them you're glad to see them this morning. Mine eyes have seen the glory of the coming of the Lord. He is trampling out the vintage where the grapes of wrath are stored. He had loosed the faithful lightning of his terrible swift sword. His truth is marching on. Glory, glory, hallelujah. The lilies Christ was born across the sea With the glory in his bosom Transfigures you and me As he died to make men holy Let us live to make men free While God is marching on Glory, glory, hallelujah Have your Bibles with you, you can be turning ahead with me to the book of Haggai. Book of Haggai in the second chapter. If you were here last week, we talked about some things to consider as we looked in Haggai chapter 1, and it talked about there about this command to go back and to, to build the temple of God. And he the Lord had instructed Haggai the prophet to share uh, several words of instruction and encouragement and also some reprimand to God's people and he told them how that they were to go back and and to do those things which they were originally instructed that they had been lackadaisical in doing uh, for some time and today when we pick up we're going to pick up one month of time has passed here at the beginning of chapter two where we had left off in chapter one and today we're going to talk about some things to remember the the Lord's going to give Hey guys, some things to speak into the people, and he's going to tell them that they need to remember several things in this passage. And, and in doing so, it's some things that also I feel like directly relate to us. While we're not rebuilding a physical temple for the Lord to come and, and to worship in like we touched on last week, we are that temple. We are uh, the resting place of the Holy Spirit where it's to reside in us and not only just reside there, it's supposed to reveal itself through us in the way that we carry our li ourselves and our lives. So hopefully we've got that mindset as we 
venture into chapter 2 of the book of Haggai. Let's look at the first nine verses of Scripture as we start this morning. It says, In the seventh month, on the 21st of the month, the word of the Lord came by Haggai the prophet, saying, Speak now to Zerubbabel, the son of Shetil, governor of Judah, and to Joshua, the son of Jehoshadak, the high priest, and to the remnant of the people, saying, Who is left among you who saw this temple in its former glory? And how do you see it now? In comparison with it, is this not in your eyes as nothing? Yet now be strong, Zerubbabel, says the Lord. Be strong, Joshua, son of Jehoshadak, the high priest, and be strong, all you people of the land, says the Lord. And work, for I am with you, says the Lord of hosts. According to the word that I have covenanted, covenanted with you when you came out of Egypt. So my spirit remains among you, do not fear. For thus says the Lord of hosts once more, It is a little while, and I will shake heaven and earth, the sea and dry land, and I will shake all nations, and they shall come to the desire of all nations. And I will fill this temple with its glory, says the Lord of hosts. The silver is mine, the gold is mine, says the Lord of hosts. The glory of this latter temple shall be greater than the former, says the Lord of hosts. And in this place I will give peace, says the Lord of hosts. This morning we've got several verses of scripture we want to try to cover here in this passage in, in chapter 2 this morning, so bear with me as we try to make our way through it this morning. But the first thing that we notice as the Lord speaks to Haggai and Haggai speaks into the people, he, he tells him that you need to give direction to the people. So we see here now the direction of the Lord for the people. So that's the first thing we want to take note of. Like I say, a, a, a month has passed from where we left off, and some of the people now had started to become discouraged. They're discouraged by what they're seeing in the temple. See, they had heard stories. Some of them maybe had seen, but most of them had heard stories about Solomon's temple and what it looked like, and they were coming to the realization that, you know what, this isn't going to be as magnificent looking as Solomon's temple. It's not going to have all the glitz and the glamour. It's not going to be the, the, the most hip church of the day, if we want to relate it to our time. It's not going to look like what we really want it to look like, what we expect it to look like. And if you look there in verse 3, as the Lord speaks to him, he, he instructs them to not compare the past to the present. We, we get stuck doing that a, a lot of times. It's okay to learn from the past. It's okay to build on the past, but we should not focus on the past, because when we start to focus on the past, we limit God to the past. We limit Him to only what He has done, not what He's going to do. And things sometimes don't always appear as they might seem. We can look at the world around us and we can focus on the negative and we can focus on where we're not as a country as we used to be. Maybe where we're not as a church or as a people or whatever the case might be. But see, that's what Satan wants us to do. He wants us to focus on the past, focus on the negatives, and it takes our focus off of not only what God is doing, but what he wants to do. So if you've got... Your scripture there, and you see that, he says, Who's left among you who saw this temple in its former, former glory? And how do you see it now? What are you looking at? Are we focused on the past? Jesus in the Gospel of Luke. It says that he said unto them, he said, No man having put his hand to the plow and looking back is fit for the kingdom of God. We see that as Elijah calls Elisha to follow him, what happens? He doesn't want to let go. And we tell him he's not fit to follow, follow him and follow the Lord until he's willing to let go. What, do we, what happens with Lot's wife as they're departing Sodom? says, don't look back. What does she do? She looks back. And that becomes her end. We see here the Lord encourages them. In his direction, verse 4, he encourages them 
to be strong. Tells them it's going to take strength to press on. He encourages them to not be afraid in verse 5. And then in verse 6 and 7, these are, the, these are the verses that maybe speak most loudly to us. In verse 7 it says, And I will shake all nations, and they shall come to the desire of all nations. What is the desire of all nations? He's speaking about the coming Messiah. He's saying, I'm going to shake this world up. This world is going to be changed. It's going to be different than it's ever seen. And I'm going to point all people, all these nations, back toward me. And he's going to do it through his son, Jesus Christ. He goes on and he encourages them and says, in verses 8 and 9, he says, This new temple is going to be better than before. He says, The silver is mine. The gold is mine. You know, it's real easy for us to look and say, look what I don't have. Look at what the rest of the world has. We get on social media and we say, well, my life doesn't look as perfect as everybody else's. We drive down the road and say, well, I don't live in a house like this or drive a vehicle like this. We focus on what we don't have. And we think we're neglected and we start to feel sorry for ourselves. And then sometimes we get a little lustful and a little jealous, and then again our focus and our attention changes. The Lord says, guess what? I, I own everything. He, he owns it all, folks. If, if he blesses us with some type of possession, that's great, but that's not what it's about. He says this temple is going to be better than before. He says the, the glory of the latter temple shall be greater than the former, says the Lord of hosts. And in this place... I will give peace, says the Lord of hosts. See, they were so caught up in what the temple was going to look like that they forgot what the temple would contain. Listen to me. We're given this vessel for a short time. For some of us, as the days go longer, we look forward to to going on and being with the Lord. I have a good friend, a lady that I, I was a pastor for her a long time ago. I went and saw her a couple of weeks ago, and as I talked to her, she was talking about looking forward to going and being with the Lord, and I, I so much appreciated our conversation, and, and she talked about how, how much closer that day was getting, and, and actually this past week she had a stroke, and, and she's still hanging on, but I know that when her time comes, she's ready to be with the Lord. See, she knew something that a lot of us forget. We think this life is about what we can have whether it's our muscles or what's in our wallet or whatever else. She knew what was on the inside. That's what the Lord's trying to impress upon them here. It didn't matter what the temple looked like. What mattered is that the Lord of peace was going to be in the inside. That's that's what he wants in our lives. He gives direction here to the people. He gives direction to us. He says we need not focus on the past, not focus on the distractions, don't focus on what we don't have. Focus on what we can have. He gives direction. Look on with me at verse 10. He continues on, and he's going to get a little little stronger worded with them. On the 24th day of the ninth month, in the second year of Darius, the word of the Lord came by Haggai the prophet, saying, Thus says the Lord of hosts, Now ask the priest concerning the law, saying, If one carries holy meat in the fold of his garment, And with the edges he touches bread or stew, wine or oil or any food, will it be holy? And then the priest answered and said, no. And Haggai said, if one who is unclean because of a dead body touches any of these, will it be unclean? And the priest answered and said, it shall be unclean. Then Haggai answered and said, so is this people... And so is this nation before me, says the Lord of hosts. And so is every work of their hands, and what they offer there is unclean. And now, carefully consider from this day forward, from before the stone was laid upon the stones in the temple, since those days when one came to a heap of twenty ephraphs, there were but ten. And when One came to the wine vat to draw out fifty baths from the presses, but there were twenty. 
I struck you with blight and mildew and hail and all the labors of your hands, yet you did not turn to me, says the Lord. Consider now from this day forward, from the 24th day of the ninth month, from the day that the foundation of the Lord's temple was laid. Consider it. So now from, from where we left in verse 9 to verse 10, two more months have passed. Two more months of time have passed and the people have still been out and doing their thing, trying to work on the temple and trying to do all these things. And and, and now we see the Lord come with a second thing. And that is a word of correction. We see the correction of the Lord and he, He brings this to the people because, see, what they had done wasn't quite accomplishing what they had set out to accomplish or what the Lord wanted to accomplish. And and he brings out something very clear in verses 10 through 13 there. He says, people cannot make something holy. People can't make something holy. We can't do anything to make it holy. Isaiah would write, and he said that, that his, his righteousness was as filthy rags. He says the very best he can do is filth for the Lord. And it's the same way with us, folks. I can't save anybody. I can, I can point somebody to the Savior, but I can't save anybody. I can't accomplish anything holy or good on my own. We can't do that. And, and see, later on, the people, the same, these same people, their descendants are going to get caught up in thinking they are what makes the temple holy. They're what makes people holy. And they miss out on it. He points out something else. Not only can people not make something holy... He tells them what people can do, and that is defile things and make it unclean. He says here, he talks about this defilement. We've lived in an environment where we've been probably more cautious of this than ever. But because I don't like talking about the the current disease, let's, let's reflect on like the flu, something we've known for years. If, if someone with the flu, hangs out or touches a healthy person, is it going to make them clean? No, that's not what makes them healthy. It's not what restores their health. But let's flip this around. What if healthy people hang out with sick people, people with the flu? Can they get sick from it? Oh, absolutely, right? It can be spread. And and he's using a similar analogy here with how sin has worked and how it had worked in their situation. What had taken place is not only were they not holy enough to make someone holy, they had hung around with sin and because of it, sin had stained themselves. All of the stuff that had happened to them, all the disease and the pestilence and the famine and everything that had taken place, the Lord says, guess what? Yeah, I let that happen. And you know why? Because you were living in sin, because you're not doing what you're supposed to. There was sin among the people and although some of them had made feeble attempts, they were unsuccessful at bringing about holiness and righteousness that only God can provide. In verse 14 it says, So is this people, and so is this nation before me, says the Lord of hosts. And so is every work of their hands, and what they offer there is unclean. Listen, folks, we can't fool God. He knows. He knows what's in our heart. He knows what's deep down in us. He knows what's in our mind. He knows the thoughts that we have, the things that nobody else can see. He he knows our true character. And we may fool other people, but we can't fool Him. And it tells us that because of their sin, it brought forth consequences. Not always... Do struggles in life come as a result of our sin? But sometimes it does. But you remember back a few years ago, there was commercials on television. There was this guy named Charlie. Y'all remember him? He, he would come with some pretty good, solid advice sometimes. One of his things of advice that, that Charlie said is, if you find yourself in a hole, quit digging. Here the Lord says, listen, if you're living in sin and you're wondering why things, bad things are happening, stop it. 
Stop digging that hole deeper and deeper. Stop where you're at. And he goes on there in verse 18, and he says, Consider now from this day forward. The Lord brings a message of correction again. He says, listen, you need to consider where you're at. Nobody else can make you right with God. That's something only you can do. You have to make that decision. So look with me at this last group of scriptures here. We've seen the direction of the Lord. We've seen the correction of the Lord. The final thing that we want to see is the connection with the Lord. Verse 19 Is the seed still in the barn? As yet the vine, the fig, the pomegranate, and the olive tree have not yielded fruit, but from this day I will bless you. And again the word of the Lord came to Haggai on the 24th day of the month, saying, Speak to Zerubbabel, governor of Judah, saying, I will shake heaven and earth. I will overthrow the throne of the kingdoms. I will destroy the strength of the Gentile kingdoms. I will overthrow the chariots and I will, and, and those who ride in them. The horses and their riders shall come down, everyone by the sword of his brother. In that day, the Lord of hosts, I will take you, Zerubbabel, my servant, the son of Shetil, says the Lord of hosts, And I will make you like a signet ring, for I have chosen you, says the Lord of hosts. There's there's a couple awesome, powerful statements in this that the Lord makes. The very first is how it leads off. You may not have caught what what the Lord's saying here to the people, but he asks a question. And it's, it's kind of a rhetorical question, but it's also not only just a question of self-evaluation, but it's also a question of, of hope and of, of promise. He said, is the seed still in the barn? Is the seed still in the barn? So if you've grown up on a farm like I did or, or even just raised a garden, you probably feel confident that, you know what, something bad happens, I can still figure out a, a way to, to raise a little food, right? I can still get by. If it takes eating a lot of corn and squash, and maybe it's not the fancier things in life, we still know how to do that. Some of us do anyway. The, the people had not been yielding a harvest. They haven't been gaining. It, it says there the vine, the fig tree, the pomegranate, the olives, none of that. None of that had been yielding fruit. They were, they were suffering. Because of their sin. But, but the Lord says, he asked this question. He said, is there so, still a little bit of seed left in the barn? He says, guess what? As long as you got some seed there, there's still some hope. Listen to me. If you don't hear anything else, hear this. Your, your life, you might feel like, has taken some terrible turns. You made foolish decisions. And you might be convinced that the Lord finds nothing good in you. There's no hope. The Lord here, he asks, is there still some seed in the barn? Let let me ask it to you a little different way. Is there still breath in your body? Do you still have life in your body? If you do, folks, listen to me. You still have hope. There's still hope. Pestilence may have came to your life by the decisions that you've made, by the choices you've made, and consequences may still last. But I want you to understand, we don't have to deal with the eternal consequences of our sin if we'll put our trust in the one who provides us with that hope. He says, is there still some seed in the barn? He goes on, tells them there, he says, listen, if repentance is made, the Lord's ready to bless them. He says, but from this day, I will bless you. He goes on and talks about how he'll overthrow the enemies, how he'll restore the nation. He speaks and and talks about this this great awakening that's going to take place. And then there's one more statement here that he shares. And and, and in that statement, it, it might cause some confusion before you. It might be something that's... Not easy to understand, but, but, but bear with me for just a second. I want to share this with you because this is some awesome stuff. He says, in that day, says the Lord of hosts, I will take you, Zerubbabel, my servant, the son of Shetil, says the Lord of hosts, 
and I will make you like a signet ring. For I have chosen you, says the Lord of hosts. What in the world is he talking about? Well, we have to have a little bit of history. We have to have a little understanding. First of all, Zerubbabel. Who, who is Zerubbabel? Zerubbabel is a descendant of David. If we look over here in the book of Matthew, the very beginning of it, it says, and, and, and these scriptures you probably won't find real familiar, but, but if you think about it, you might know where it came from. And after they were brought to Babylon, Jeconia begot Shatil, and Shatil begot Zerubbabel. If that's in Matthew chapter 1, guess what that's talking about? The lineage of Christ. Here he's saying, he's saying, listen, you're, you're chosen for a purpose. And I have a plan for you. And then with this plan, he goes on further and he says, I will make you like a signet ring. What he's talking about whenever he talks about a signet ring in that day, the, the kings of that day, the rulers of that day had a, had a ring that they would wear on their finger. And any time something of significance, whether it was an order or a decree, anything was, was sent out. They would take and they would put poor wax to seal that paper. And then the king or the governor or whoever was in charge in that area would take and they would impress their ring upon it. And with the impression of that king's ring, that, that seal was official. It was not just a, a significant do, a document. It was the most powerful of documents. He says, I will make you like a signet ring. He says, guess what? Out of this people is going to come a promise. And it's not just any promise. It's a promise of a king who's coming. That king's name is Jesus. His name, we know him as Jesus the Christ, Jesus our Lord. He says to the people, he says, I'm promising you that if you'll turn to me, I'll put my stamp on you. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to put my, my seal of approval on you. Our righteousness isn't good enough. We can't do it. We can't achieve it. But the Scripture tells us, the Scripture actually we, we looked at in Sunday school this morning, talked to John chapter 1 about the Word and the Word coming out of heaven and coming to us. It says, but as many as received Him, to them He gave the right to become children of God Listen to this, here's the key. To those who believe in His name. Today, if there's anything that we need to remember, we need to remember who our identity is found in. These people had had an identity crisis. They had thought just because they were of the family of David or just because they were Jews, everything was good enough. But it wasn't. They were living in sin. It doesn't matter who you are. That's the truth, folks. It doesn't matter who you are. It doesn't matter how much money you've got in the bank. It doesn't matter how many good deeds you do. The only thing that's going to matter is that if we have that stamp of Jesus Christ upon us. Have you done that? Today, can today be a day that you'll remember? A day that you'll remember forever? Today, what's the Lord speaking to you? If you would rise to your feet. They're going to lead us in a song of invitation. Before they do that, bow your heads with me just really briefly. Lord and Heavenly Father, you see us, each one as we are. You know our situation. You know our condition. You know what's going on in our lives. You know what's going on in our future. And Lord, we thank you for loving us anyway. Lord, I pray if you're speaking to someone here today, maybe you're moving in somebody's heart, I pray that you give them the boldness and the courage to respond to you. We pray this in Christ's name. Amen. He will. If we'll trust him, he will save us. That's a promise that we can Rest assured in. Thank you so much for being here. We're not quite done. We've got a couple of things to take care of. But we so appreciate you being here with us today. May God bless you this week as we and you continue to try to serve the Lord and live like Him. This time you can be seated for just a second. All right. If not, today's a special day for more than just our holiday weekend. It's a special day for us here at the church because for some time now we've been preparing and planning and, and hoping to have and everything's hit and 
plans have changed, and, and we've finally got a day that we're having a child dedication. Um, it's, a, it's a special opportunity that we get to do that. This time I'm going to ask Kyle and Megan and Terry and Jessica, if y'all will, come on up here. Br- bring all these young'uns with you. <laughs> this is a special time for these families, but also for our church family as well. Today, Kyle and Megan bring Juniper Moore and Tilly Monroe, and Terry and Jessica bring Legend William and Ivory Grace to pledge themselves before God in this congregation to raise their children in a way that honors God. Parents, if you agree with these statements, please respond after each of them with we do. Do you recognize that these children are as gifts from God and give heartfelt thanks for God's blessing? Do you pledge as parents that with God's help you will bring up your children in the discipline and instruction of the Lord, making every reasonable effort with patience and love to build the Word of God, the character of Christ, and the love and joy of our Lord into their lives? And do you come to dedicate your children to the ultimate control and will of God through the Lord Jesus Christ. Church, if y'all will stand with me. Do you, church, agree to support these parents by your example, through your acts of service? Do you agree to reinforce biblical instruction and love these children under the direction of our Lord Jesus Christ? If so, please respond with, we do. Deuteronomy chapter 6, verses 4 through 9 says these words, Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your strength. And these words which I command you today shall be in your heart. You shall teach them diligently to your children and shall talk of them when you sit in your house, when you walk by the way and when you lie down and when you rise up. You shall bind them as a sign on your hand and shall be as front lids between your eyes. You shall write them on the doorpost of your house and on your gates. The raising of children is a great and vast responsibility. It's been often said that it's the responsibility of an entire village. It is the responsibility of a church. It's a responsibility to come alongside these parents and to assist them. Let's do that together. If y'all will, let's bow and offer up this final prayer of dedication. Father, we dedicate these children to you with all of our heart, our soul, our strength. Please help these parents and this congregation to set a Christ-like example that they may grow to love and to serve you throughout all their lives. Bless these parents with wisdom and patience and grace that they may train up their children in the way that they should go. It's in Christ's name we pray. Amen.